You know, it's, uh, I'm glad to get up here. I'm glad Phil gave me the opportunity to, to speak every once in a while. And he mentioned this is the Blueprint series where we've been talking about God's blueprint, God's design. And Mother's Day, we talked about his design for mothers. And last week, Phil talked about his design for greatness in his sight. Today, we want to talk about God's design for a nation. The Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. Now, in that Psalm of David, uh, who is Israel's greatest king, and a prophet of Jehovah, of Yahweh, he is speaking specifically of the nation of Israel, the nation that Blake was talking about. But God is going to bless any nation whose God is Yahweh. Now, of course, there is no nation like that today at least no political and geographical nation that I'm aware of. I mean, the Muslim world is probably about as close as we come today to a modern nation who claim allegiance to a specific deity and laws from that deity. But, of course, their God is not Yahweh. He is Allah. And they're not one nation. They're many nations, and most of whom do not even agree with each other and more apt to be fighting one another than working together. Now, let me just say... There have been times, I'm old enough to realize this, when the U.S. was close to being a nation whose God is the Lord. In the decade I grew up, in the 1950s, Christianity was very strong. Many national leaders were Christians. At the urging of the president, Congress added, in God we trust, to our money, and under God, to our Pledge of Allegiance, in the 1950s. Over 90% of Americans claimed to be Christians, and more than half of them worshipped every Sunday in a church building somewhere. But even then, we weren't a Christian nation. Our government was not based upon Scripture. Our laws were, were not rooted in Jesus. We were a nation that had many Christians in it. And when we started, uh, probably the majority of our founding fathers were Bible-believing Christians. Certainly, many of our first citizens were Christians who came to America to escape the religious persecution of Europe. They weren't looking for freedom from religion, freedom from worship, but they were looking for freedom to worship Jehovah according to their own conscientious understanding of Scripture rather than being forced by the state, as they were in Europe, into being Protestant or being Roman Catholic. I mean, they were forced to do that. And that's why our founding fathers here intentionally separated church and state. Christianity was never intended to be forced upon anyone. It's always been a relationship with God in which people voluntarily became involved due to love, not laws. Christianity has always been a relationship of love, never a religion of rules and rituals, in spite of what many people may think. Several of our founding fathers were not Christians. They were deists. And so, as you read their writings, you'll find many references to God, but hardly any references to Christ. They believed in a supreme being, a creator of the universe, but they didn't accept Jesus as God who became flesh and revealed himself to mankind. They believed that God permitted his creation to administer itself through reason and natural laws, so they rejected the supernatural elements of Christianity while stressing the importance of the ethical conduct that fit their reason. Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Thomas Paine were um, some of the deists among our founding fathers. Even George Washington likely was a deist, although he combined some Christianity with it. Jefferson even published his own version of the Bible in which every single reference to miracles was deleted. Nevertheless, we're going to see from Scripture today that there is a nation whose God is the Lord. There is today that nation. And it all began about 4,000 years ago, early in the book of Genesis, with a guy named Abram. Abram was living with his wife and nephew in a place called Haran, about 570 miles northeast of Jerusalem, when God called him. 
And he said it this way, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who uh, bless you and curse those who curse you. And in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And not long after this, God also promised Abraham he would give to his descendants, the land from the river of Egypt all the way to the river Euphrates. About 24 years later, just before Abram's son Isaac was conceived, the Lord appeared to Abram and repeated this promise and also changed his name. God says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. I have made you a father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. God made it very clear to Abraham that this covenant with his descendants would come through his and Sarah's son, Isaac, who would be born about a year later. And when Isaac was born and then had grown up, God appeared to him and assured him. He said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. The covenant promise then went to Isaac and next passed on to Isaac's son Jacob, who before he was married had a dream. He was on his way back to Haran to find a wife for himself from among Abraham's family there. And God appeared to him in that dream, that vision, repeating the very same promise he'd given his dad and his grandpa. He said said to him, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. In you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done everything I have promised you. So Jacob found that wife when he went back to his ancestral home. In fact, he found two wives. He married sisters, Leah and Rachel, and he fathered 12 sons, and God changed his name also, and those 12 sons became the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. The promise of the nation was reiterated. He says, your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you, and I will give to the, land, the land to your descendants after you. So all of this, from Abraham through the 12 patriarchs, is the beginning of the nation of Israel. But it took them about 500 more years to get established. In fact, the rest of Genesis discusses how they, due to famine, Moved to Egypt, eventually becoming slaves of the Egyptians. Next week, Phil's, Phil's going to talk about Moses, who rescued that nation from 400 years of slavery in Egypt and led them into their own promised land, where the nation eventually grew to be a world power under kings David and Solomon. But why did God do this? What was the purpose of God in developing, making this nation? Well, God destroyed the inhabitants of the earth once before. He saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of man's heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man upon the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And so he brought the flood to cleanse, to renew the earth. And now God chose Abraham to become the father of a nation. And he developed that nation This nation would be God's people. They would be a model nation to all the other nations of the world 
and a light in the darkness. We sang this morning about being a light. Well, through Moses, you, 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 those of you who know Scripture know that through Moses, he gave them the Ten Commandments. He gave them the law by which they were to both govern their own personal lives and their nation. Paul summed it up this way, the Apostle Paul. He says, they are the people of Israel, chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them and gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful uh, promises. God gave them great privileges to enable them to fulfill his purpose, to be that holy nation, to be a light to the Gentiles. In fact, God later says to them through the prophet, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness, and I will hold you by my right hand and watch over you, and I will appoint you as a covenant to the people and as a light to the nations. But Israel exalted their privileges and neglected their purpose. That's why I pray that we will do better than they did. They focused entirely on their position as God's people. And they looked down their noses at the Gentiles, everybody else around them. God wanted them to be a light, and instead they became a blight. Rather than loving people and leading them to God, they judged people and drove them away from God. Nehemiah, one of their prophets, sums it up this way. He says, they became disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your laws behind their backs and killed your prophets who had admonished them so that they might return to you. And they committed great blasphemies. That's what Blake was talking about a while ago. That's what we see in Exodus. That's what we see in Numbers, Deuteronomy. Therefore, he says, you delivered them out of the hands of their oppressors who oppressed them. But you delivered them into, I'm sorry, the hands of their oppressors who oppressed them. But when they cried out to you in times of their distress, you heard from heaven. And according to your great compassion, you gave them deliverers who delivered them from the hand of their oppressors. Phil's going to speak about that one next week, Moses. But over and over again, this same scenario played out. God would deliver them, and they would fall back into the same patterns. And God would deliver them again, yet again, they would fall away. Why did God keep working with them? Because they were his people. He chose them. He loved them. And so in grace and mercy, he would see them through, always maintaining a remnant of, a remnant of those who were faithful, because he never forgot his promise to Abraham. You can always count on God to keep his word. He promised Abraham, through you and your descendants, all the world will be blessed. And that brings us to the main reason God preserved a remnant. Through that nation, through that lineage, God was going to bring forth the Messiah and Savior Jesus. In Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, There are over 200 prophecies about the coming Messiah. So the nation was eagerly awaiting the Lord when he came. The angel Gabriel was sent to Nazareth, to Mary, a descendant of Abraham, to announce that she was going to give birth to Jesus. Here's what he said. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob, that's Israel, the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. John the baptizer, who was the son of a Jewish priest, was sent by God as a forerunner to announce the coming Savior and King. John announced the kingdom of God was coming. And when 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 Jesus was crucified, Pilate fastened a notice on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The Jews, the Jewish leaders, wanted him to remove that, but he refused. Little did Pilate know that Jesus was not only the king of the Jews, he was king of kings and lord of lords. Around 575 years before Jesus came, A guy named Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. It was the most powerful nation on earth. And he was a bit of an egomaniac, not unlike our current president. And he had a dream that was driving him crazy. And so he called in all the magicians and the sorcerers and the the wizards 
from throughout his kingdom, and he offered them a huge reward if they could tell him, number one, what he dreamed, and number two, the interpretation of that dream. If they couldn't, they'd be killed. Well, now, who can do that? I mean, no normal person would ever expect somebody could tell him what he dreamed. Only God could do that. But among the Jewish captives that had been brought to Babylon because of Israel's constant disobedience was a prophet named Daniel. And Daniel knew God. And he also knew that God would give him what the dream was and the interpretation of that dream. And he told the king that the dream was political. It had to do with kingdoms and kings that would come after Nebuchadnezzar. And for those of you young people, you guys are naming your kids weird names. Get this one. Mate. Write that one down. Nebuchadnezzar. That's a, that's a good one. You know, you might want to get that one down. Uh, what a handle, huh? But anyway, the, he's, here's what he says. These kings would come after Nebuchadnezzar. He describes the Medo-Persian Empire. Then he describes the Greek Empire. And then he describes the Roman Empire. And when Daniel mentions the Roman Empire, he says, and in the days of those kings, in the days of the Roman Empire, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. That kingdom is Jesus' kingdom. The kingdom of God. The body of Christ. It is the only nation today whose God is the Lord. Because you cannot be born into this Holy Spirit nation until you surrender your life to Jesus as your king. Now, God took 2,000 years to bring this kingdom into being. You and I, who are in Christ, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. We belong to that, that kingdom. Scripture says he has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. In the New Testament, the kingdom of God has a twofold sense of both being present and future. The kingdom of God has come in the lives of those who let Christ reign in their hearts. Revelation 1, 6 says, He made us a kingdom. And the kingdom will come in its fullness, completeness, when Jesus returns to deliver the kingdom, that is the church, to His God and Father. And then every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Yet those of us who have already confessed that, those of us who have already made Christ king are now in that kingdom, and we have a foretaste of future glory. In Ephesians, the Holy Spirit is called the earnest of our inheritance. And it's the same word we use today when somebody buys a house and puts down earnest money as a promise or guarantee that they will complete that transaction. The earnest money is part of the down payment. It's a foretaste to the buyer of more uh, I mean, yeah, to the seller of more to come, more the same. The Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. His love, His power, His gifts, the, His fruit in our lives are a foretaste of future glory and a guarantee that what lies ahead for us is also a present reality now in our lives. That which is ahead of us has already become true within us. That's why Jesus said the, the, the kingdom is within you. Paul says, those whom he justified, these he also glorified. He uses past tense. Through God's Spirit, we even now experience his glory. As we are transformed into his image by the Holy Spirit from one degree of glory unto another. And we have the guarantee of still greater glory to come. The very fact that God has begun to work in us is proof that he will complete that work. The Apostle Paul reminds us, for our citizenship is in heaven, from whence we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. Our privilege and purpose is similar to Israel's, but far, far greater. And that's why I say I pray every day that we do better than they did. See, we are a model to people. 
But Jesus says to us, you are the light of the world. What an amazing privilege to be a part of his kingdom. He called himself the light of the world, and then he tells us, you are the light of the world. The book of Hebrews says that we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That's that kingdom that's eternal. So let us be thankful. We have a strong city. We have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. As his people, the Lord loves, protects, provides for, empowers and saves us. One day, you and I will be delivered from the presence of sin. But even today, God by His Spirit delivers us from the power of sin in our lives. By the Spirit who lives within us. See, that's why we do better than Israel. The Holy Spirit did not live in them, but He lives in us who allow Jesus to reign as King in our lives. Sin is no longer our master. See, salvation is not pie in the sky sometime in the by and by. It's power in the Spirit day by day. Listen to these promises. I mean, these are amazing promises. We are more than conquerors through Him that loves us. God always leads us in His triumph march in Christ. Greater is He who is in you than He who is in the world. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to appropriate this life-giving, sin-conquering power now to enable us to be victorious over the temptations and the struggles and the trials of this life. So the Apostle Paul talks about the privileges of our salvation and the grateful joy that they bring. He says, God's power enables us to be bearing fruit in every good work Growing in the knowledge of God, not just the knowledge about God, but the knowledge of God. He says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. And the result of God's, all God's power in our lives is that we are joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. We're not grumbling, we're not complaining, we're giving thanks for he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What great privileges we have. But we never, must never forget, like Israel did, that we're privileged for a purpose. The Bible always maintains that balance between the right to become a child of God and the responsibilities of being a child of God. We are children of the King. We need to learn a lesson from Israel and see that we maintain a balance between our privilege and our purpose, between getting and giving, between feasting on the privileges and fulfilling the purposes God has for us. All the privileges that are ours as members of his kingdom are an expression of God's indescribable love for us. That's why he just sticks with us. And that love transforms us. That's what changes us to accomplish his purpose in this world. God reminds us we love only because he first loved us. And there's nothing more central to kingdom people than love. I mean, just think about what the Scriptures say. Repeatedly and emphatically command us, live in love. Put love above everything else, before all things. It tells us that if we love, we have fulfilled everything else the Lord desires of us. Jesus told us that. The Apostle Paul told us that. But if we don't love, what's 1 Corinthians 13 say? Nothing else we do is of any value. Most remarkably, Jesus prayed that his disciples would replicate the loving union that he has with his Father by participating in that eternal union. He says we are participants of the, in the divine nature. 
so that the very same love shared by the Father with His Son and the Son with His Father may be in us and by the Holy Spirit shed abroad in our hearts to others, uh, from our hearts to others around us. Jesus even prayed. You remember in John 17 that by our abiding in the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for the Father, the world would know that we are His disciples. He prayed that the world would believe in Him on that basis. Our God-like love is to be the distinguishing mark of the believer. It's the proof that God is real and that God is love. And that's exactly how God used Jesus to reach people and how he uses us, his body. When we love them, when we accept them, when we care for them, even in the midst of their sin, their brokenness, their pain, just like God loves us. While we were yet sinners, while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. I mean, think about that. God himself went to the farthest extreme, even taking upon himself sin, which is antithetical to himself, in order to express his love for us and reconcile us to himself. That's why we can say that the value and the worth that God ascribes to us, the love he has for us, is unsurpassable. We are his treasured possession. But don't let it go to your head. That's what Israel did. It's because of his love. The quality of love revealed in Jesus dying for sinners reveals the quality of love shared by the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in that holy triumvirate. The quality of that love is quite simply incomparable. A greater love cannot be imagined. You cannot imagine a greater love than the love that Jesus has for you. Despite our sin, God deemed us worth dying for. Listen to what it says in Hebrews. For the joy, talking about Jesus, for the joy set before him, the Bible says, Jesus endured the anguish and the suffering of the cross purely for the joy of sharing the ecstatic and indescribable wild love of God that he has for us, Jesus allowed himself to be hung on that cross. We are invited, you and I are invited, to receive the worth and value that God ascribes to us in Christ. We're invited to receive that love. And we are called and empowered to extend that worth and value to ourselves and to every single human being that you meet. Every person at work, every person at the soccer game I'm going to this afternoon, they need to feel from me that same worth and value out of the fullness of life and love, freely received by us from God. We are commissioned to love Him and to freely love our neighbors as ourselves. In fact, that is all we are called to do as citizens of his kingdom. That's our only assignment. That's our only purpose. To love him with all we are and to love our neighbors like he loved us. Everything, that incorporates everything we're called to be in Christ and everything God wants from us as his children. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. All that he does for us, all that he has done, all that he does, leads us, motivates us, equips us, and enables us to serve others. To reach them for Christ with his love, to build them in Christ with his love, all to glorify God, fulfill his purpose, and build his kingdom. God called Abraham thousands of years ago because he wanted a people to be his. And through all these centuries, he has always had a people who were his, a people who modeled his love and his life and his character, a people who made the world a better place because they represented him. They were his body, his feet, his hands, his tongue to make a difference in the lives of others, a people through whom all the world can be blessed. The Bible triumphantly declares, you are a chosen race, a holy priesthood, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people for God's own possession. Why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's be what we are in Christ. Let's live up to our privileges as children of the King. Let's fulfill our purpose as citizens of heaven. Let's shine as lights in this dark world, loving people like Jesus loves us just as we are. Let's commit ourselves to love others like he does, radically, fully, just like Jesus did. We are the body of Christ. You and I are his arms to help others, his hands to touch others, his voice to speak good news. Let's amaze the people around us today with his amazing love. Let's give to others what we've received from him. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, we thank you for the amazing love that we have in you, for the amazing grace that we've experienced in your son. We thank you, Lord, for sticking with us, for seeing us through. Lord, we've all blown it. We've all been broken. We all have messed up. But you were there, and you continued to love us. Help us to love others like you've loved us with that love that just transforms and changes us into your image. Father, we thank you for your love and grace, and we pray that you would just help us to realize the power that you've put in us to shed your love abroad from our hearts to others. Help us to represent you well in this world. In Jesus' name.